Hey, everybody. Welcome to this edition of Mindful Social, where we talk about ways that we can use social media in a mindful way and really kind of put our message out there and maybe not be so negative. Everything's so negative these days. It's making me nuts. So I really want today to talk about ways that we can use social to help ourselves think about the positive and really move forward with our lives, our businesses, and the world. Today, I've got an amazing guest, Nate Howard. And, you know, I've been really impressed with the videos that I've seen from Nate. He is a public speaker. He's started a great movement. And Nate, I'm going to let you give us a little bit about yourself and toot your horn. Yeah, no, thank you, Jenny. It's, it's, it's a blessing to be here. I'm, I'm thankful. Uh, my name is Nate Howard, and my mission is to inspire a generation to tell their story before others do. Um, it's so important. So my work really stems from, you know, this idea of you have to realize your greatness. You have to realize your power. And if you don't, you know, people are going to be working daily to, to show you that you're not worth what you actually should be feeling uh, as, as you are. Um, and so, you know, the work that I do is really kind of speaking to inspire, you know, individuals to understand once you realize the power of your story, uh, that that's what creates the joy, the, the peace, the love, the happiness in, in your life. And the work that I do with Movement B um, is now kind of using social media to inspire um, uh, individuals in their daily life to, to allow them to tell their own story and kind of create a positive space uh, to interact with others who have realized the power of their story as well. Hmm. I, I think from what I've seen on the app so far, you know, I'm seeing people kind of work through several stages to develop their story. Can you talk a bit about that and, and what it takes to get someone to really understand their story? Because I think most of us have no clue. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I think we, we talk about vulnerability um a lot but i think when people talk about vulnerability they don't understand uh, really how hard it is to get to that space especially when you are uh, a minority where you feel like you've been voiceless where you feel like um, even if i tell my story and i am open about what i am or who i am who's really going to listen to me mm -hmm. so i think the process um in that sense is that we've created a safe space. We've created a safe environment. Um, different from other social media platforms and just other communities, you know, we're very intentional about um, being in a, in a space where we want you to be vulnerable and open to saying that even if you share your story, you're gonna be loved, you're gonna be appreciated, you're gonna be thanked and empowered for sharing the story. So I think, you know, the process and building that first is creating that safe space for people to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And in that, um, I think we've set the tone as myself, as other people in that self has been able to just push um, for stories that, you know, are not necessarily told or almost kind of, you know, most people shy away from. So building that safe space and then setting that tone, continuing the challenge you know, the status quo and being able to, you know, share the stories that aren't really always heard. And so I think that's the power of what we're doing. Um, and so, again, I just say that safe space is really important for those mm -hmm. stories. And these stories don't have to be mind altering, mind blowing kind of things, right? It's really more about discovering yourself and what it is within you that is your strength. Is that accurate? No, definitely, definitely. Um, in that, I mean, I think what a lot of other social media platforms, just a lot of other stages have pretty much set up for us is that we're looking for instant gratification with our story. Um, we're looking for us to tell our story and then people to respond, you know, immediately. And if we don't get that response, we feel like our story isn't valuable. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the problem. Um, and that's what, you know, you know, stops people from sharing their story because one, I don't have this hard, tragic story and I can't really share it. Or, um, or I do have a very hard, tragic story and it's going to be hard for me to share it. 
And the goal is to say that everyone has a story. And if we kind of let go of what social media has allowed us to, to produce, which is these gimmicks, pretty mm. much, or these, you know, these things that allow us to get the instant gratification. We're living on this surface base uh, level of our story. And our goal is to dig deeper to the root of who we are. And these are just, you know, general things that represent us that we don't normally share. But if we get to that space, we realize deep within we are uh, human beings who represent love and joy and, and, and this peace that's that's deep inside. But we're afraid to be happy. We're afraid to be vulnerable in sharing some of these experiences. And at the same time, if we will allow that pain or whatever that we're struggling with, that will lead us to the space of, of our joy and, and our love. So these are just everyday, typical, different stories of whatever that individual wants to share that they haven't been able to share on other platforms um, because of how it's been set up. Well, we all know that, you know, you look at things like Facebook and, you know, everybody shares maybe what their dog did or the positive things that have happened in their lives. Some other people share nothing but negativity, but they're not really letting you see the real person. It's this facade that we put up. And, and you know, I think on all social platforms, no matter what platform it is, there is a facade that we put out there that isn't our real story because you're right, you know, you don't want to be too vulnerable, um, especially, you know, these days with the political climate, you know, I got trolled last night on Twitter and, you know, called names and all this stuff because I asked one question. And so that really shuts us down, right? It shuts us down from allowing ourselves to be vulnerable, um, you know, and it, it makes us reactive instead of responsive. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really important distinction as well. Um, within a community such as, as Movement B, you know, that uh, responsiveness is what brings our humanity to the surface. Yeah, no, it's, it's so important. Everything you're saying is right. I think we've created these, these brands, you know, these social media brands. And I think, you know, there was a point where I was this way on Twitter and this way on Facebook, and I was another person on Instagram. Um, and so we have all these characters that we're trying to maintain, you know, mm, when you hard work, it, when you really think about it, you're stressing yourself more about it because nobody's thinking that deep about, about you. You know, I think because they're thinking too deep about themselves. So <laughs> if you make sense of it, you're so worried about what people think of you when they're so worried about themselves and what people think of them. And so we're constantly in our head of should I post this on Twitter? If I post this on Facebook, what are people going to say? If I post this picture on Instagram and we're sitting there just taking our time, going through the filters, going through these just different things of saying, man, should I, should I post this? And you have to ask yourself, what's the purpose? You know, why mm -hmm. am I posting this? Why am I sharing this? When the essence of movement B you know, the post section says, tell your story. And when anybody tells their story, there's, there's no hesitation. You don't need to really begin to think about it. If you're thinking about it, you're, you're thinking too hard about who you really are. And this is allowing you to just make mistakes, be free, be open. And when you make that post that says be, that doesn't mean your story is finished. It doesn't mean that your story, um, you know, doesn't have edits and that you can't go back and revise whatever that is. That's just saying, hey, I'm being open to whatever I'm experiencing now. And so mm -hmm. that we move social media from this whole idea of I have all these followers or I have all these likes and I have all this attention, but to a space of how we can use technology to as 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 therapeutic in a sense. Hey, I'm just going to let out. I, I'm, I'm going to vent and I have this community to do so. I know a lot of individuals, a lot of students who who felt alone, who felt like they didn't have anybody to talk to. They couldn't talk to the parents. They didn't have friends close by to talk to. But they do have a computer or they do have a phone. And in that community, challenging them to just be open and to fill that space. And, you know, people have gone on to the platform to share all different types of stories. And then strangers are responding saying, hey, I've been through that. I've experienced that, you know. And that's important. And that's the power of 
what this platform is and what we hope to, to transcend social media to be. Mm. And that's the power of telling your story and in a community that's purposeful and intent and, and intentional in doing so. And that's the big difference, you know, the, the purpose of having the purpose and being intentional with what you say without trying to direct it too much, really telling what your story really is. Um, that's very vulnerable for a lot of people. And, you know, but when you get a response from somebody that's a real human to human interaction, that's huge. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, we've all written blog posts and gotten Zippo on comments and felt completely unloved and uncared for. And then someone comes in and says, wow, you know, I, I can relate to that or I really understand that it makes all the difference in the world. And I think, you know, the web has gone through so many different iterations where sometimes we, you know, have these platforms that are really kind of alien and, and as you said, very brand focused and you're really about putting your brand out there and not about putting you out there. But in the old days, there were a lot of really deep conversations, you know, and I think there still are in places, you know, such as Movement B that are protected so that you don't feel judged. Um, you know, it brings to the question to mind, though, is managing a community like that. Um, and this is a young community. So I don't know how much of this kind of conflict you've had within the community. But how do you how do you maintain that level of acceptance and conversation? Yeah, I think it goes back to you know, what I was saying earlier is that the tone has been set. And, you know, when I think of other social media platforms, you look at Facebook, you look at Twitter, you look at any of these uh, spaces, there wasn't necessarily a, a tone to say, hey, we're focused on love, truth, and justice. Mm -hmm. These are platforms that just say, hey, connect with friends, um, you know, or if, you know, sharing your story or making posts or whatever it may be, but it's not intentional. And so that makes us different because, we're not trying to be a Facebook or Twitter. You know, this is, you know, this is specifically for individuals who represent love, truth, and justice. Mm. And that's important for what we represent. And so in that alone, um, people who don't identify that will just feel like I don't really exist on this platform. I don't really see myself being loving, telling the truth, or, you know, fighting for justice. And that's okay. This platform is not for you. Hopefully you will get to the point where you feel like it is so that you do feel represented in this community. Because what happens in that sense, those individuals, because this happened, there was a guy who came on and he was like uh, saying F this and this is gay and you know a lot of this other hateful stuff. The funny thing is you can change your screen name and it's Trouble Team, which mm. in his name he was already telling his story um but what happened was he was just reported in the community itself kind of you know policed it and said hey this type of stuff is not accepted here um uh, and i think in the future as we grow and, and we scale i think we're going to run into a lot of other issues as well but i think as building a tone and again being very intentional that this is not just a platform where everybody comes on and just connects with friends because again there is no friends there are, are no followers um, hmm. really based off the goal of creating a community of those individuals who are focused on love, truth, and justice, um, and being very intentional about that and holding that message. We have daily quotes every day that represent that. So the people who feel like they log on to Movement B are looking for that type of support. If hmm. they're not, you know, they can go to all the other social media platforms that exist, but you're coming on to Movement B for a specific purpose for a certain type of community uh, and what it represents. Yeah, I think that's, I think having a focused community like that is really important now, um, you know, because as you said, there are so many platforms that you could be on if you just wanted to tell us about your lunch. And, you know, it's it's not necessarily important to anybody. And, uh, you know, I think everybody's kind of seeking places where they can feel safe and and have conversations that are deeper than they are on some of the, the more shallow platforms. So can you tell us a little bit about who so far has been attracted to Movement B and, and what kind of 
demographics you're you've got now and where you hope it to go yeah uh a lot of our demographic has been young uh millennials um and these people these are people who have been you know who felt voiceless mm -hmm. um and with that these are people who don't like the situation that they're in in the sense of how they're looked at in society um so these are people who have been fighting the stereotypes, you know, fighting, you know, the labels that have been put on them. And also in that, being able to realize the issues and things that they've been dealing with and figuring out how to join a community to, to push a movement, which is, you know, the basis of why it's called Movement B is saying, hey, I'm here to push a movement for love and positivity, understanding my pain and struggle of where I've gone through but now pushing for something greater. So we represent, you know, individuals who identify themselves as activists, you know, individuals who identify themselves as, you know, leaders, entrepreneurs, you know, creators, innovators, you know, people who kind of see beyond uh, the norm, mm -hmm. uh, people who want to make a change to say that, you know, the way society has been set up, um, I don't feel included. I don't feel represented. And so, here on this space, um, how can I be around other individuals who, who feel the same way, who feel like their story hasn't been told? Mm. That they're tired of other people telling the story for them. They're tired of being put in a box, labeled and shipped off and saying, this is what black people are like, or this is what all women are like, or all young, you know, and challenging these ideas um, and getting the support to say, hey, we both agree that this is not okay. So what could we do in telling our individual stories? My story connects with yours. And now let's push a movement to, to grow this and invite more people on this platform who feel the same way so that offline we can meet in person and begin to make that specific change in our mm. Yeah, and offline is a big part of the platform, it seems. So let's talk a little bit about that. How are you facilitating those meetings? and? And where do they generally happen? Are you more in one city than another or one location than another? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, our base has been in San Diego um, and we're growing the platform. What's cool about the platform that is based on geolocation. So mm -hmm. the stories are posted based off where, where you're at. Um, so if I'm Tom here in San Diego, uh, specifically La Jolla, um, and then someone else posted a story uh, maybe 15 miles away from me, um, I could see that Tom posted this story 15 miles away from me. And that's very important to say, hey, these are stories that are happening um, in our community um, and in our communities specifically connected to our city. In that sense, you can travel on the app and say, hey, I want to see stories in LA or I want to see stories in the Bay Area or I want to get out the state and see stories in Chicago, stories in New York. And ultimately, I want to see stories outside the country. Maybe I want to see stories in Ghana, stories in Paris, wherever it may be. And so in that, we're hoping and we're pushing that people begin to self-organize and that they be able to uh, meet with this individual or groups of individuals based in their city. Movement B in that base, we're continuing to have events, um, specifically starting in San Diego, where we have these general events and then get people activated on the platform to continue the conversation after the events happen. Mm -hmm. As the conversations happen after the events, we're hoping that those individuals begin to organize uh, to have other events, whether that be Movement B events or specifically their own kind of one-on-one -on -one meetings at coffee shops, whatever it may be. Um, but hoping to create and build a self-organizing system that, that works it for itself so that ultimately Movement B just serves as a platform um, and that the individuals represented begin to host their own events based off love, truth, and justice, and, you know, the philosophy of what we're representing here um, using this platform. I really like that aspect of it because that, then that's fairly unusual. Um, you know, I'm in San Jose, and so we're not as active here in San Jose as we are, as you are in San Diego with the movement, but it was really interesting to see what people locally are saying and how that relates to my experience. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really cool way to be able to connect with people locally 
you know, it, it makes it even more of a community feel and you're having some of the same experiences. Um, so I want to go back a little bit to telling your story before somebody else does and, and how that concept really um, can change a lot of things in a person's life, understanding what their story is. And, you know, can you talk about some instances where, for example, somebody told your story for you and you didn't have that opportunity? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, a couple of years ago, while I was a, a student at USC, I, I was graduating and I was hosting a party. Um, the party was organized, registered. Uh, we had security. Everything was put together. Uh, meanwhile, there's another party going on across the street, which you know didn't have security, wasn't registered with the university, uh, but predominantly uh, white students. Um, at about two o'clock in the morning, uh, the night of that party, officers came to my party to, to shut it down in response to noise complaint, which I, which I understood. Uh, but as I was handling things, um, 79 LAPD officers showed up to my house in riot gear. This has wow. never happened to me before. And I, this is beyond me on why there needed to be 79 officers uh, in riot gear for a party that had no fights. Uh, there, was, there was no violence. There, there, was, uh, there was nothing uh, for that to, to present itself in that situation. What made it even worse was across the street, they told the students to stay in the house and be safe while they were dangerous. Clearly we were, I guess, dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Um, which, you know, this here, the students of color, I mean, I automatically seen it as, you know, racial discrimination, sure. um, racial profiling. And, you know, that was the first time where I was ever really put in handcuffs. Um, uh -huh. And I was put in handcuffs, taken to the squad car, and they made a barricade on my street, 23rd and Hoover, down the street from USC, and began to push us all down the street. Uh, and the way I was just treated that night, the way uh, people from my party were treated that night, uh, was definitely having someone else tell the story, um, which is rooted in how this country, you know, sees people of color, um, mm -hmm. sees, you know, minorities, which we really haven't talked about. Uh, which we really haven't had these vulnerable, open conversations about race relations in America, which we're seeing a lot of today, not because it's new, but because it's getting videotaped more. Yeah. Um, and so um, I realized at that point, there was uh, issues that I've had before, and I found myself angry. And when I was angry, I didn't know who I was fighting. I was mad at the police. I was mad at the government. I was mad at you know, society the situation. Yeah. I didn't have a solution. I didn't know what I was doing. So here I'm just, I'm swinging at the air because I don't know who I'm fighting. And that's when mm. I realized that the most important thing that I could do, the most important thing to inspire others who, who are dealing with situations like mine is to show them the power of their story, to realize that if you don't tell your story, someone else is going to tell the story for you. And be proactive in doing that, and not being, you know, react reacting and waiting for these instances to happen, and to prove that no, you shouldn't arrest me. I'm this positive black man who's educated at USC. You got the wrong guy. Mm. It's not about that. It's about realizing that no matter what, someone is going to try to to treat you uh, in a way that's really not you. And if you let them, you're going to continue. To, to battle these issues of, of who you are and allowing them to tell your story, which you unconsciously accept. And you're gonna to begin to reinforce those stereotypes and see yourself mm. as a when you really aren't. Over and over and over again. Yeah, over again. And mm. I think it's happening to a lot of people. And I think the base of realizing at that moment, here I am in front of Time of the Trojan at USC saying, hey, forget the system. You know, which was important to raise awareness of what was going on. But at that moment, I have to channel that frustration and anger into something productive, which I had to dig deep and say, who am I really? And why am I allowing these people to tell my story? So mm -hmm. let me be proactive in understanding my greatness and who I am and inspiring other people to do the same. And in my meditative space, 
begin to just quiet myself, quiet my mind, my spirit, let go of all the images of what people who in the media look like uh, in regards to me and what they're saying I am and saying, wait a minute, this has all been a story that's been fabricated and told to make me feel inferior. And in my space of just meditating and understanding my power, I quiet all of that out and I get to the root of who I really am. And I find this love, this peace and joy that's so powerful that allows me to be productive in telling my story to create that more in the world and inspiring other people to do the same. Mm. That's really powerful. And I, I think, you know, bringing meditation and mindfulness into it where you kind of separate yourself from those feelings that obviously you can't just resist those feelings because the more you resist, the more, the more reactive you become and being able to just settle and go, okay, you know, what's going on and, you know, really be able to, to make, I don't want to say make yourself, but actually understand the situation maybe from a distance um helps a lot and you know i mean as a woman i encounter those conflicts quite often as well and it, it's always something where you have that reactive moment where you're like hey what's your problem that is not the right response but it is my response because i tend to be really reactive and and not want to go okay what your deal is is not my deal it's it's really a big lesson. It's more about them than you, you know. Mm. When they're when they're trying to put, you know, oppress you or make you feel inferior, that has nothing to do with you. You know, and when you allow that to, you let them win because that's that's the goal. Mm. That's the goal that with anybody who is trying to attempt to tell your story. Because they fully don't understand their story, because they don't fully understand how great they are, how loved they are. They want to make you feel like you're not loved. Mm -hmm. And the more you understand your love and your power, and the more you realize that in telling your story, you're helping them tell theirs. That's the power of what I believe could really impact change. You know, and I think that's a base of where we begin to start and, and to move. And of course, there's all other types of action that we need to do, but we can't fully be productive in it if we're allowing what I would say the antagonist to continue to tell our story um, in that sense. And you have to realize you are the hero. And mm. sometimes we are playing a cameo role in our own story or a supporting role. And we're allowing you know, ourselves to, to be almost deleted from what we created, you know, and then allowing someone else to just take control of it. And now we're just, having this script in our hand, feeling like this is who I'm supposed to be. And it's completely wrong. Hmm. So you did a, I saw a video that you did where you talked about poetic meditation and, and how you develop your own story. And I think, you know, a lot of us may have an idea of what we think our story is, and we may be totally wrong because we're really thinking about the brand that we've built, not what's not what's here, not what's in our heart, what's in our real story. So you could, can you talk a little bit about how you find your story, how you extract your story and begin to understand it? Yeah, no, definitely. This stuff, you know, this is stuff that I'm still learning and, you know, I, I struggle with and, I've gotten to a point where I understand it more. So what was interesting is when I started my story at the incident from USC, I thought that's where my story started. You know, that this happened to me at USC, 79 LA PD officers showed up to my house. I came back to San Diego to start Movement B to inspire other people to tell their story and boom, that's where my story starts. But I realized that the story really began at, at birth, right? Where I had to, and this is what I challenge my students, and it's, it's hard for some, but I think a lot of people pick up on it and they get it. But I asked them to think back to the time of their birth, right? And there's that quote by Mark Twain that says, you know, the two most important days in your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. And when you go back to the day of your birth, of course we don't remember, right? But if we use our imagination, which life is really about when we talk about our story, like the greatest stories are imagine a time, right? 
to, to, to once upon a time, create, to, to dream. And so when you go back to the day of your birth, I ask them, what was that emotion? That day you were born, I was. How did you feel? What did it smell like? What did it sound like? What did it look like? What did it taste like? What did it feel like? And as they're writing this, they're beginning to write their story. Because their story in that base is, is supposed to be of what you create, what you imagine. So the day you were born, you came into the world. How did you feel before you begin to begin to uh, uh, begin to have all these conditions? You were conditioned to do this, and now you had to learn to do this and all of these other things. Before all of that happened, you had this power of creativity to imagine and to dream big. And so that's where that base of telling your story begins. And so many people can't do that because they've been conditioned with so much that they can't even get past this idea of, wait a minute, I can't think that big or I can't do that. And they start playing on their limits. And so letting them let free of that, get to the base of when they came into the world, begin to imagine, create from that sense and realize that's where their story begins and begin to write and develop and to imagine and to dream big uh, from that. And that's where the base and that's something I'm still learning and creating as as we as I'll continue, as we all continue to understand our story and continue to edit, revise and, and make sense of what it means so that eventually and as we're going, we, we feel confident in our story. And once we have that confidence in our story, the more we tell it, the more it makes sense to us and the more we are able to create more of it and build and inspire people to tell theirs, which then becomes a reflection of ours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that's a really good point too, that as you tell your story and you read other people's stories, they all kind of merge together and, and the people that you really resonate with, I believe that they're, they're drawn to you more that as you start to reveal, you know, who you are and you start to yourself, not necessarily to the world, but the right people gravitate towards you and, and you start to have a much better environment. Yeah. <laughs> you do if you're just listening to what people tell you to be. Yeah, no, I think it's powerful. I mean, this essence of being, and I, and I mentioned, you know, my girlfriend, um, those are the most, you know, being with her is the most liberating times I had because I know that I'm completely myself. Mm. You know, I still struggle going out in the world and saying, hey, I have to be Nate Howard, you know, and I don't know what that specifically is, you know, because, you know, to your point earlier is, you know, we're living this brand, we're living this image, and it could be frustrating because we don't feel like we live, we're living up to it, or if it's, you know... <laughs> You know, what does it really represent at the end of the day? Um, it's important in a space, but the most important part of it is that you're human in that, you know, people are buying your products or into your services because they can humanize with you. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know, I mentioned my girlfriend because she reminds me of that all the time. It's like, wait a minute, why are you doing that? That's not you. You know, like, I know her. <laughs> You know, I know the real you. And so being in that environment, that's when I'm the happiest, when I don't have to put on a show where I don't have to act. And, you know, it's normal. We all do it, whether we're in the professional business as a public figure or if we're, you know, working at, you know, this company. Uh, we put on our work uniform and then we go home to something else. And so that, you know, to that point, I've actually done some workshops and corporations and had people just cry because they've been like, man, I don't know, you know, my coworkers and my employees that I'm working with. And we're just all living this surface based life. And it's just a struggle because I can't fully be myself. And, and, and that's and that's painful. That's painful to continue to live this story. That's not really you for for money, for for acceptance or whatever it may be. And to just to fully be free and, and embrace that and be OK with that. Now be okay with making mistakes and, and doing things that are wrong because at the end of the day, it's you. It's your mm. it's, it's, and that's okay. Yeah, I think, you know, being your authentic self is, is huge. And, you know, you talk a little bit about what I 
term as imposter syndrome. And I think it's a big thing in public figures. And it, it's really interesting. There there have been several discussions lately within my circles of, you know, people and and you speak on the public stage, you do all these corporate trainings. And every once in a while you go in and you just have imposter syndrome and you're thinking, what the heck am I doing here? You know, why can I tell these people what to do when, you know, I'm having a day when I'm not feeling really up to it? Um, you know, I, I think that's something that those vulnerabilities make us maybe better at what we do, because then that to me shows that you really care about the people that you're talking to, the people that you're teaching and what their stories are and what their relationships are. It's not just about, oh, hey, here I am, worship me. It's, hey, you know, I'm here to help you. And when you go from that kind of listener, customer centric standpoint, you have a totally different way of looking at things. And I think that's humongous. Yeah, no, you're so right. I mean, a lot of the work I've been doing recently is been trying to understand what's been going on with, with the police in the community. And, you know, talking about the issues of police brutality, talking about the issues of what's what's happening with, you know, those individuals in the community, how they interact with police. And, you know, we just had a meeting recently. And I think what a lot of leaders or activists or whoever, you know, is, you know, pushing a movement, uh, they may act like they have a solution or they may act like this is what we need to do. And mm -hmm. I came to the meeting and I'm saying, hey, I don't know what it is that we need to do. Like, I don't know what the solution is. I have no idea, none whatsoever. Right. And that was powerful because it's saying, hey, let's come together and let's just talk. That's okay. The more we tell our individual stories, the more we're gonna move to something. But if I came in here and saying, hey, this is what the police are doing, this is what's happening in the community, and these are the things that we need to do, I would feel, like a lie and a fake because literally if that was the answer then all the issues in this country of what's been going on would be just done it'd be so easy it would be so easy right <laughs> right but, but you know i think we have media pundits we have all these other people saying hey that's what we need to do and and if that's what you're doing if you're spending more time on interviews talking about the issues and not literally working with the community to understand the frustrations and the stories, uh, then you are maybe living that imposter idea of, hey, you know, I'm doing this, but not really deeply rooted in how we kind of come to understanding what it is that we can do. And I get it. I think people do it unconsciously. I think people, you know, some people consciously, you know, profiting off the struggle of others, people's stories and different things. And I think that's the problem of why we're doing this work because the stories should be coming from the individuals themselves. And how can I just offer a platform? How mm. can I share my story with you so that I can inspire you to tell yours? Not that I am some hero or God among us all that has this solution, um, but that it's more of all of our individual stories coming together, white, black, you know, uh, from whatever different backgrounds and saying, this is how we move together uh, to push for all these individual stories to represent this this larger story that, that represents us all. Yeah, I, I totally get that because in the end, you know, we need to be able to inspire thousands and millions of people to take positive action. And you're not gonna do that by hitting them over the head with it. <laughs> you need to listen and, you know, be able to, make them all feel part of the conversation, part of the solution. Yeah. And you don't feel that way. You know, it's like when you go to an event and there's one person who's the blowhard in the corner, who's going on and on about how they have all the answers. Mm -hmm. If you took a 10,000 foot view of the room, you would see that there are a lot of little groups off to the side that aren't anywhere near that person. And those are the ones that, you know, maybe are having conversations that can move change, but that one person who's really talking to hear themselves heard, maybe not so much. Yeah, that's important. Definitely. Yeah. And I think that's what we're seeing. I mean, uh, when we talk about Movement B, 
And we talk about this idea of revolution. And I use revolution in the idea of this revolution of self, right? Um, when you could understand that the revolution is, is, is a renaissance, right? That what we're fighting is, is you versus you and realizing that the more you let out your art, you know, your expression, your poetry, your music, your song, right? That's what actually shifts culture, mm -hmm. right? That's what actually creates the change in society is this, this is that you are now represented. And the only way you begin to be more represented in society that your voice is heard is to tell your story and to inspire other people to tell theirs as well. And that's what we begin to shift. And that's what allows us through today's modern technology to allow that to exist. I mean, we've seen the rise of Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and these platforms that didn't exist before. So if you weren't able to get your story out there through traditional media before, you have no excuse today. Mm -hmm. because you can get your story out there. And so when we talk about the revolution in that sense, we're talking about innovation. We're talking about using the technology that's here today to push those individuals who have been voiceless, who haven't had their story be heard, to allow communities to lift those stories up and push them so that they do become trendy news. And But then don't allow that to just be trendy news to keep that story alive because the problem is, is when it becomes trendy and it dies out and we think that the solution is solved just because it's gotten some big <laughs> yeah. which is problematic in, in its own sense. And so, you know, the power is that, you know, I'm a leader and I, and I obviously started this movement and, you know, ultimately I will die. And this whole idea of that when the revolutionary dies, the revolution dies, that shouldn't be the case. Mm. That we so many stories that hopefully you forget that I am the founder and that it is not my movement, but that is all of these thousands, millions of individuals who represent movement B. So there's not one person you can point out or attack to kill this movement. That you're mm -hmm. going to have to try to kill every single individual one of us to kill this because we're alive and understand the power of our story. Well, that's really the power of social is that you know, when you tell your story to me and I tell my 10 friends and those 10 friends tell their 10 friends, it really can move mountains. It can can do amazing things, but you have to keep that ball rolling. You have to keep things moving so that we don't forget about it tomorrow because everything on social media is a flash in the pan. Mm -hmm. Th things can go viral. They're gonna last about a week max maybe a day and then it's time to move on so then you need a new story and finding ways to bring those up and and keep that moving there's no way that you could do that all yourself it just couldn't happen yeah. so you know and and really it is the power of the community that makes it so beautiful and such a scary thing yeah, so i would love for you to tell people how they can be a part of movement B and where they can find you. Yeah, definitely. Uh, if you want to find out more about me, uh, you can go to Nate Howard Speaks. It's Nate Howard Speaks .com. Um, You can find more of my videos, more about me. Um, and also, if you want me to come, you know, speak, you know, in any space, you can go ahead and book me there at Nate Howard Speaks .com. Great. You want to be part of the movement that we're building that we've been talking about, Movement B. You can go ahead and go to movementb.org. That's movementbe.org uh, and sign up. And once you sign up, you're going to be right in um, the community, whether you're in San Diego, San Jose, Chicago, wherever you are, you're going to see stories based off your community. Um, but you can travel and see stories all over the world. Um, and so really mm -hmm. challenge you to participate there. And if you uh, have an iPhone, um, you can go ahead and download the Movement B uh, app directly on iOS. That's great. And, and I really encourage people to download the app because it's really fun to read that and, and see what's going on locally and really feel a part of Movement B, which is pretty fun. Are you planning an Android app? We are planning an Android app. Uh, those who don't have Android, uh, Bear with us, go to movementb.org and you can uh, log in and participate from your desktop computer. Um, 
I wouldn't recommend going on it uh, on your mobile, movementb.org. Mm-hmm. Um, but Android will come out towards uh, towards the end of this year for sure. That's great. Well, thanks so much, Nate. It's it's really been a pleasure, and and I'm really excited to see where you go with this. No, thank you so much. This has been a this has been a blessing. So thank you for having me. And this is important conversation to have. I agree. I totally agree.